Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Award from the Lord. James over here with you, and uh, appreciate your patience. Appreciate Caleb being able to keep going. Uh, run a little late tonight. We had uh, an extended Bible study. We had some visitors from uh, our tent meeting that came tonight, and so we were having a Bible study uh, for their behalf, and uh, was going really well. So we just kind of kept going and kept going, and uh, that's just the way we roll in the Church of Christ. If you want to study the Bible, we'll study with you. And so it went a little long, longer than uh, usual, you might say. And so I'm just getting down here, walking into the studio. And so uh, it took me a little while to get set up. But nonetheless, I appreciate uh, you staying with us and hope that you're ready to continue studying from God's Word. The lesson we're going to do tonight, really, I hope, will help answer a question that, that you might be having. It was a question that was asked uh, Sunday by one of our visitors. And um, so I thought, well, we'll just continue discussing this uh, uh, tonight in our Bible studies uh, with that individual and hopefully that it may be a, a something that will help clear up some things that you've been wondering about the Church of Christ and why we believe what we believe. Uh, Peter said be ready to always give an answer to everyone that asks and so we want to do that very thing about the hope that's within us and so tonight's lesson is designed to help clear up some things that maybe um, you had or some questions you had about Baptism, but before we get into that, I want to uh, give you our content information, a word from the Lord at gmail.com. It's how you can reach me by email, 276 340 2653. If you'd like a, uh, a copy of this lesson or you want to study the Bible any other time, we'll be glad to, to do that with you. Just give us a call and we'll help you out any way we can. Now, as I said, this question was asked, and really was asked about how do you become a member of the Church of Christ? And I think that's a very good question because when we're talking about becoming a member of the Church of Christ, I know a lot of people think uh, poorly of us when we say that about the need to become a member of the Church of Christ. But friends, let's think about it in all honesty. Individuals who say that you don't need to be a member of the Church of Christ or who say that the church is not important are saying that the church that you read about in the Bible, the Church of Christ, is not important. That's what they're saying. Now, you can't have it both ways. If the church is not important, then it shouldn't matter if we say that you are not a member of the Church of Christ. Now, think about that. When we're saying that if you're a member of a denomination, you are not a member of the Church of Christ. I don't know why it bothers you, because you said it doesn't matter. But all of a sudden, when we say that you have to be a member of the Church of Christ, now you want to be a member of the Church of Christ, but then it doesn't matter if you're a member of the Church of Christ. Which is it? You can't have it both ways. But what we're talking about is becoming a member of the church you read about in the Bible, and how do you do that? Now, one thing that is, that is crucial to understanding about the Church of Christ is how you get into the church. And so we want to focus on one particular step that so many people have hang-ups on, so many people have problems with, and that's what we're going to discuss right off the bat. So we're going to talk about baptism, but I want you to turn and notice some things about baptism that probably, apparently you haven't thought of, or really you haven't uh, considered, or maybe you don't care to consider, if you have a problem with, with baptism. But listen to what Paul says in Romans 6, verses 3 through 6. Now, the reason why I want to start here is because this is a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4, he talked about the death, burial, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's the gospel. Now, most people will understand that that's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 1. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, excuse me, which I preach unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. By which also, that is by the gospel, by which also ye are saved. So the, the gospel is what saved. If ye keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which also I received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, so there's his death, and that he was buried, there's his burial, and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture. So there's the death, burial, and resurrection 
of Christ. Now, that's the gospel. Now, if we're preaching the gospel and we're going to be obedient to the gospel that saves us, how do you obey the gospel? How are you? How do you uh, conform to the gospel that saves? How do you conform to the death, burial, and resurrection in order to be saved? That's what Paul said. So let's go to Romans chapter six. Romans chapter six, and beginning at verse three. Now notice what Paul says. He says, "Know ye not?" Now he's talking to individuals who had already been baptized. He's talking to individuals that some of them. I believe the church at Rome got, got its beginning in Acts chapter 2. There were strangers of Rome present uh, on the day of Pentecost. In Acts 2 and verse 5, there were devout Jew, Jews, Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. And if you come on down and you start reading, all the individuals that were, that were there in verse, uh, uh, verse 9, notice you, got, you have uh, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and so forth. Now notice... Uh, in verse uh, 10, strangers of Rome. So on the day of Pentecost, these, these strangers of Rome, these individuals from Rome, were there, and they heard the gospel. Now, what do you think they did? Well, they went home. And when they went home, they started teaching the same gospel that they had learned, that they had been taught on the day of Pentecost. And the gospel, whenever it is preached, will always produce Christians. And thus, the church at Rome was established. And so Paul is writing to these individuals. He hasn't been there uh, as of yet. He's wanting to see them. But notice what he says. Know ye not. Now, don't you know this? That as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Now, I find it interesting how many people want to talk about, well, I've been baptized, I've been baptized, I've been baptized, but they don't stop and think about the fact that if they have been baptized according to the Scriptures, then they have been baptized into the death of Christ. Now here's why this is significant, friends. Because look what Paul says. Paul says that if, you've been, if you have been baptized according to the Bible, then you have died with Christ. As many of us have been baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death. Now friends, think with me. Most people, I'm going to say 99%, of so-called Christianity that <clears throat> talks about being saved and Jesus is their Savior, want to say they were saved and then baptized. They were saved and then they were baptized. That's what they say. Now, friends, listen, you have to be honest here. You don't have to be honest with yourself. You know that's probably what you were taught. If you were taught you were saved, saved by faith, and then baptized as an outward sign of an inward faith, inward grace, <clears throat> then you know that you were taught salvation comes before baptism. But it is in baptism where you die with Christ. Now friends, I don't know about you, but you don't go around burying or killing saved people. Death is for the individual who is a sinner. You have to kill the old man of sin. And that is where you die to that old man of sin, in baptism. How can you die to sin without dying with Christ? Paul says this is where you die. So you, you die with Christ. Now notice this. In Romans 6, look what he says in verse 5. Romans 6 and verse 5, he says, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, Planted together in the likeness of his death. Friends, do you realize the closest you can ever come to dying with Christ is in baptism? Now we're going to look in a moment about where you contact the blood of Christ and it's in his death. Now, if you want the blood of Christ to be applied, you have to get as close as you can to his death. And Paul says you've been planted together in the likeness of his death. That's in baptism. That word planted, it's really kind of a, a misleading word, I guess. It's an, it's an English word, the word, the old English word. It actually means united together. Think about it this way. If we have been united together, joined together in the likeness of his death, that's as close as you will ever come to dying with Christ 
is in baptism. But many of you, if not all of you watching, are saying, well, you know what? I died with Christ. I died with Christ when I just believed. And then I was baptized. Friends, did you die twice then? How did you die to your sins before you were baptized? This is where you die with Christ. And so Paul says we, we are planted together, united together in his death, in the likeness of his death. In baptism. Right? In baptism. And then watch. Verse 3. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. Now you're buried. You die. Now you're buried. So death is, uh, baptism is a death. Baptism is a burial where you die with Christ and you're buried with Christ. Now, for all of my friends out there who think that they can have a little water sprinkled on them and be baptized, friends, you have to explain what a burial is. You don't know what a burial is? You've never buried somebody by just sprinkling a little dirt on them. Now, I don't have it pulled up, but I've played before the preacher. Maybe he's watching. The no-name preacher. He wouldn't give his name. But he called in and said, well, he could baptize someone on their deathbed by sprinkling them with water. He said, you can't bury someone by sprinkling. He said, well, I can get them really wet. No, friends. Really wet is not buried. Really wet is just wet. But it's not immersed. That's what, that's what baptism is. It is a burial. It is immersion. And it all takes place in baptism. And then we're resurrected with him. Resurrected with him. Now look at this. In verses 5 and 6. For if we be having planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall uh, be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. Let's stop there. We are in the likeness of his resurrection. Friends, you cannot have a new life until you die. You can't have a new life until you die. You can't have a new life until you're buried. And you can't have a new life until you're resurrected. Now someone please explain to me how you can die, be buried, and resurrected with Christ without being baptized. And how can you do that? How can you do that after you have already been saved? After you've already a new creature? How do you do that? Can you please tell me? How, how do you do it? Can't do it. This is why baptism is so important because of what it does. What it does for the individual. In baptism is where you die, you're buried, and you're resurrected with Christ. Now look what he says. He says, we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. How was it that Christ was raised from the dead? How was Christ raised from the dead? Now he said, he said, no man takes my life from me, I lay it down, that I may take it up again. But he was raised by the power of God. God raised him from the dead. God raised him from the dead. Romans 1 verse 4, declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. God did not leave Christ in the grave. He raised him from the dead. That same power, now friends, notice this. It is that same power that can raise you and I from death where we kill the old man of sin and we bury the old man of sin and then we're raised as a new creature. Notice this in Colossians 2 and verse 12. Colossians 2 and verse 12. Paul says, Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. How does God raise someone from the dead who is already alive? You're claiming you are alive with Christ, a new creature in Christ, before you were ever dead, uh, before you ever died, was buried, and were resurrected. But it is in baptism 
where God operates and raises you from the dead. By the same power that raised Christ from the dead, God raises an individual from the dead because they died to sin. Now they can be raised, raised to walk in the newness of life. Now, friends, you just, if you say, if you're saying that you were saved before baptism, then you don't really understand what the Bible says. Our old man is crucified. Our old man is put to death. Our old man is buried in baptism. And God, the power of God that raised Christ from the dead is what also raises you and me from the watery grave of baptism to, to make us a new creature in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. How does that happen? How does that happen before baptism? So that this, this is why baptism is so important. Because the connection that it has with remission of sins and fellowship with Christ. The unity that we have with Christ. The likeness of his death, the likeness of his burial, and the likeness of his resurrection. Now friends, I know we all understand the importance of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. But for some reason, when it comes to dying, being buried, and being raised from the watery river of baptism, everybody says, I don't want anything to do with that. Well, if you don't want to have anything to do with baptism, you want to relegate it over here to, well, it's just something that you might ought to do if you want to feel like it kind of sort of maybe have an inclination and it's not too cold and the water's just right and it's a feel-good Sunday, whatever, if we want to do it. If that's how you feel about baptism, then that's how you feel about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Carl Keith up here at Cross Point, they had their building dedication. He said they're going to have a whole bunch of people baptized. You know, they're all lined up to be baptized that day. Some special event. Well, whoop de doo All you did is get wet. All they did was get wet. Because it wasn't according to the scripture. They weren't being baptized for the same reasons that the Bible says. I know that. They won't teach that. They won't teach that. But this is what the Bible says. Now friends, you see what we're talking about? This is why baptism is so essential. Now, let me just show you this for a moment. 1 Peter 3 verse 21. Let's talk about this verse. Here's the connection of baptism and the resurrection of Christ. The like figure wherein to even baptism doth also now save us. Now let's stop right there for a minute. Baptism does save us. Now somebody says, well, they were saved by the ark, they weren't saved by water. So therefore it's just a figure. See, it's just an example, it's just a figure of bab baptism, just a figure. Well, I tell you what, you know what, I'll give you baptism as a figure. It's a type. But notice this. Here is the picture that you're missing. In the days of Noah, when it comes to Noah, notice this, notice what the Bible says. In the days of Noah, while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is eight souls, were saved by water. So Noah and the other seven on the ark with him were saved by water. And the like figure... Whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. The picture is water saved Noah and, the, and his family. The like figure is baptism saves us. They were saved by water. Hello. They were saved by water. And guess what? The like figure baptism saves us. Now it's not the water in itself, but it's the obedience in doing what God says with the water, with baptism. Just like the water itself didn't save Noah in the sense of, well, you know, if, if uh, we didn't have this flood, we wouldn't be saved. God could have saved Noah any way he wanted to. But here's how he said. He moved Noah from one old sinful world into a new world. And he separated the old world from the new world with water. Same thing takes place right here. So the like figure whereunto baptism doth also now save us. Now, I want you to notice this. Let's just, for a moment, 
let's just skip over this parenthetical phrase, all right? This is just a, a thought here where Peter, Peter's coming along, he's, he's saying this about baptism, and then he puts in this thought about what it's not. Well, it's, it's not to put him away the field of the flesh, all right? It's not taking a bath. It's the answer of a good conscience toward God. But notice this, let's say it this way. The like figure whereunto baptism doth also now save us by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's not the putting off the filth of flesh, but it's the answer of a good conscience toward God. Baptism saves us by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. How does baptism save us by the resurrection of Christ? We just talked about it. Baptism saves us by the resurrection of Christ because it is in baptism where we are raised with Christ, where we are resurrected with Christ. If we have been planted with Him in baptism, that is in His death, we've been buried with Him in baptism, then we are resurrected with Him in baptism. There's the connection. There is salvation there. Saved by baptism, baptism saves us through the resurrection of Christ. Now, <clears throat> Baptism is something, friends, that has to be done if we're going to be obedient to God. Notice, it's the answer of a good conscience toward God. Toward God. You know, I hear people all the time say about baptism. Well, y'all believe in work salvation. That's what they say to us. Y'all believe in work salvation. And then they say, Ephesians 2 in verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And then we're told, see, y'all boast all the time because y'all believe in work salvation, and y'all bragging about y'all's works and everything. And friends, I want you to notice, this is something that, that uh, one, of my, one of my kids said to me tonight. This is what she said. She said, you know, I shouldn't, I told her I wasn't going to give her credit, but I, I guess I will. She says, well, here's the thing. She said, they're talking about if we are baptized, then we're boasting because we're doing a work. She says, but then they turn around and say, well, it's an outward sign of an inward grace. We're being baptized to show what God has done. She says, who are they showing? She says, it sounds to me like when they're baptized, as an outward sign, outward expression, she says they're the ones boasting. Friends, that's exactly right. Who's boasting about it? You know, God has saved you, so you're going to get baptized. You go, well, <laughs> oh, look how good I am, boy. Boy, yeah, I'm, I'm saved. Look how proud I am. I'm going to go I'm gonna get in the water down here and let the preacher dunk me under the water. So I can be saved. So I can show everybody. So I can boast and brag to everybody. Look what I've done. That's not biblical baptism. That's not the baptism that the Bible talks about. See, when you're obey, obedient to the gospel and you're baptized according to the gospel, that's not something you brag about. Because that's just doing what God said do. But if you're out here being baptized as an outward sign of an, of an inward, inward grace or prof, you're professing, you're showing everybody that, that you've done something or got something, boy, you're just bragging about it. Who's boasting? Who's using baptism as a thing to boast about? Not the Christian. Not me. It's you. Peter says... Baptism is connected to the resurrection of Christ. Now, if you don't think baptism is important, you don't think the resurrection of Christ is important. That's all there is to it. If baptism is not important, then the resurrection of Christ is not important. But here's why baptism is so important. Because it puts you into Christ. It puts you into Christ. In Galatians 3, verse 26... 27. Look what Paul says. He says, For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You can go ahead and put the phone lines up, Matt, if you want to. 
As many of us as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. All right, we put on Christ. Now, friends, when you put on Christ, that puts you into Christ. We've been baptized into Christ. Now, in Christ is where all spiritual blessings are. Ephesians 1 and verse 3. Ephesians 1 and verse 3. We've given all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So I want to be in Christ. How do you get into Christ? I get into Christ by being baptized into Christ. Salvation is in Christ. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 10. How do I obtain the salvation that's in Christ? I'm baptized into Christ. See, friends, you don't get what is in Christ until you get into Christ. And that's why baptism is so important. Because it puts you into Christ. It, it's where you're, you die with Christ. It's where you're buried with Christ. It's where you're raised with Christ. It's the door that puts you into Christ. This is why baptism is so important because of, all, because of all the things that it does. Because of all the things that, uh, that, it, that it connects to. And people want to say, well, it's not, it's not that important. Friends, it is that important. Because it puts you into Christ. How do you, how do you obtain or how do you come in contact with all the good things that are in Christ? You have to be baptized into Him. Now, how do you get into Christ if you haven't been baptized? Or if you say you were already in Christ and baptism is not essential, then how did you get into Christ? If baptism is not essential, how did you get into Christ? Please tell me. Someone call in and tell me, please. How do you get into Christ if you're not baptized into Christ? See why it's so important? See why we stress it? Because of what it connects to. Baptized into Christ. Friends, I don't know about you, but if I wanted to, if I wanted to uh, 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 partake of a great feast and I knew where it was going to be taking place and I had to get into that building, I would go through the door to get into the building so that I could partake of everything that's inside. And that's the reason, by the way, friends, that's the reason why when individuals who are not members of the body of Christ come and assemble with us, you know, we stress them about the Lord's Supper. Look, the Lord's Supper, we love you, but it's not for you. You're not in Christ. That, that's a blessing. That's a privilege that for those who are in Christ. Now, I'm not going to tell someone that they are not in fellowship with Christ because they're not in the Lord's church and then turn around and tell them, yeah, come fellowship with me and my Lord with the Lord's Supper. And there's a lot of individuals that will come and they'll assemble with us and they'll go, well, uh, we didn't partake of the communion. Well, where do you normally go to church? Oh, we're at the Baptist church or the Lutheran church or wherever church. How often do y'all take the Lord's Supper? Well, sometimes they do it once a quarter, once a year. So if you went to where you normally went, you wouldn't get to take the Lord's Supper either. Anyway, well, that's right. So why does it bother you if you didn't get to partake of it with us? It's a privilege, friends. It's a privilege and a blessing for those who are in Christ. So if I, if I want to partake of all the blessings, including fellowshipping with Christ, when, which, by the way, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 16, Paul says, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? That, that's the word is fellowship. Now, the Bible says that those who are outside the body of Christ, that is, they have not been baptized into Christ, they are without Christ. They're aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenant of promise. If someone is outside of Christ, how then, how then do you get to fellowship and partake? You know, even the Passover meal that the, that the Jews observed, 
if you weren't circumcised and if you weren't part of the covenant of Israel, you didn't get to partake of the Passover. It wasn't, just, wasn't for you. You had to be circumcised. You had to become a Jew in order to partake of the Passover meal. Well, guess what? Christ is our Passover. First Corinthians 5 verse 7, Christ is our Passover. And if you are outside the body of Christ, you're not a spiritual Jew. Romans 2 verse 29. Romans 2 verse 29. He is a Jew which is one inwardly and in the circumcision is out of the heart. Now, if you haven't been baptized, that's where circumcision takes place. Circumcision in the heart takes place in baptism. The operation of God. Ephesians 2, 11 and 12. Now, if you are a physical Jew, you wouldn't be able to take the Passover because you're not circumcised. Well, if you're not a spiritual Jew, you haven't been circum your heart hasn't been circumcised with the operation of God, your sins haven't been removed, in the waters of baptism where, where the operation of God takes place, why then would you expect to get a blessing of a communion fellowship meal with Christ when you're outside of Christ? See how it works, friends? It's very simple. It's very simple. It is a blessing and a privilege for those who are in Christ. In Christ. And baptism takes care of that. Baptism is what puts you into Christ and puts you in contact with all the blessings and privileges that are in Christ. Baptism is what puts you in contact with the blood of Christ. Look again what Paul said in Romans 6 verse 3. Know you not that so many of us that were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Everybody knows that you can't be saved without blood. The blood of Christ has to cleanse you. The blood of Jesus Christ has to cleanse you from your sins. Washed in his blood. Revelation 1 and verse, verse 5. John, John is writing and he says to him that hath, uh, unto him that uh, loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. How does Christ wash you in, in his blood? How, does, how, do, how, is, how are sins washed? In the blood of Christ. Washed us from our sins. We'll look at this. In Acts 22 and verse 16. Why tearest thou? Saul of Tarsus was told. Why tearest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. Wait, I thought the blood of Christ washed away your sins. That's exactly right. It's in the waters of baptism where you contact the blood that washes away your sins. Calling on the name of the Lord. You washed from your sins. The blood of Christ washes sins. And the waters of baptism wash away your sins. Why? Because that is where you die with Christ. And thus that is where he shed his blood. And that is where you contact the blood. See friends, when you think about baptism, you think about all the things that, that, uh, uh, that it does for you. It really shows the wisdom of God. God is a very efficient God. In other words... He doesn't, he doesn't have you do so, all these different things when you can do one and take care of all of them. So baptism, this is what it does. Baptism is where you die with Christ. It's where you're buried with Christ. It's where you're raised with Christ. Baptism is where, while you're dead and buried with Christ, God also removes your sins. Takes away your sins. So, circumcises the heart and removes the sins. It all takes place at the same time. Where you're there. If we come to the blood of Christ. It's where when you're raised. And then you're put into the church. You're a new creature. All these things take place. In obedience to God and baptism. God's very efficient. God's very efficient. You know. While I got you here. Let's, let's take care of this too. Reminds when I was uh, <clears throat> when I was young. I I guess I was nineteen or eighteen or nineteen somewhere in there. I had my appendix taken out, and it was it was back before they did all the 
endoscopy or whatever they call it with a little, and cut a little hole in there and go in there with the camera and cut everything out. Cut a big old gash on me. So I woke up in a hospital bed. The nurse comes in, and I had these, you know, those compression socks on. I had to put them, put them on. And so she comes in, and she looked at my feet. She scrubbed my feet, and she said, I had a big old wart on my foot, planter's wart on my foot. Boy, it hurt. She says, while you were under, while you were under, you should have had the doctor take that wart off too. Well, I didn't know. Boy, it would have been a good time for it. I mean, you just cut off all the warts or whatever that you want to do. I, I'm not feeling anything. Well, that's what God does. God says, well, you know what? While we're under, while you're under, while you're dead with Christ and you're buried with Christ, I'm going to take away your sins. And I'll put you in contact with the blood of Christ. See how it works? It all takes place in baptism. Now friends, when you say, well, baptism doesn't matter, it's not important, then you're saying the death of Christ is not important. The blood of Christ is not important. But here's what we want to talk about. This is where we're getting to. The reason why we started with all this about baptism is because of what ultimately baptism does for you, and that is puts you into the body. Baptism puts you into the body of Christ. Now notice what Paul says here. This is 1 Corinthians 12. I got it kind of small there. Let me just enlarge it here. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 12. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body body. All right. All baptized into one body. Many members come into one body. That one body is Christ. Now friends, think about this. If baptism puts you into, into Christ, and it also puts you into the body, the body is the church, guess what? Baptism puts you into the church. It puts you into Christ, into the body, into the church, because it's all the same. Colossians 1, 18. Colossians 1 and verse 18. He is the head of the body, the church. The church is the body, and the body is the church. Baptism puts you into one, it puts you into the other one. If it puts you into one, it puts you into the other. We're all baptized into one body. I thought we were baptized into Christ. Exactly right. Baptized into the body. Into Christ. Into the church. Now friends, if baptism is not important, then the church must not be important. Now I can see why so many of you out there are saying, well, the church is not important. The church is not important. I can see why you say that because you say baptism is not important. See? The thing that puts you into the church, you say is not important. Well, you must not think the church is important. Makes sense. Imagine you're building a house. Here you're building a house. you got a house built up here. And you say, well, I'm not going to put a door in it. Why? It's not important to get inside. That building's not important. But that's why... Buildings have doors on them because it's essential and necessary. It's important for a building to have a door if you want to get inside. But if you don't think that the building is important enough to get into, you won't put a door in it. And that's what you all think about the church and about baptism. Well, baptism is not important because the church is not important. Church is not important. I don't need baptism to get into it. You just want to talk about being in the church, but you don't want to go through the door. See? The church is not important. The church is not important. It's what you say. Of course you feel that way. But friends, the church is what Christ died, died for. 
Jesus said, upon this rock, I'll build my church, Matthew 16, 18. And that's why it's so important, because he shed his blood for it. All right? It's the, it's the church of Christ. Now, you may not think it's important, but the Bible clearly says it is, because it's his body. If Christ is important, then his body is important. If Christ is important, then the church is important. If it's important to be in Christ, then it's important to be in the church. If it's essential to be in Christ, then it's essential to be baptized into Christ. See, when you start taking away things that are important, you're going to start getting rid of everything. Now, the question that was asked Sunday is, well, how do I, how do I become a member of this church? Here's how do you do it right here. You have to be baptized into the Lord's church. Now, well, any church will do, right? What is the one body? What is the church? Sometimes I think if we change some of the terminology, we can, make, we can maybe understand it. We can understand it if we use other things. So this is what we're going to do. Instead of talking about the one church or the one body, let's talk about one burger place. Let's talk about one specific burger place. Because there's a lot of places that sell burgers, fries, milkshakes. All kind of similar. Right? All kind of similar. But listen, there's one specific kind that we're talking about. And all the ones that look similar, they're not counting. Like this, McDonald's. I had a sister, I asked her. I asked the sister, I said, now, you, you used to work at McDonald's. They closed it down up here. You worked at McDonald's. So they sell burgers? Yep. Do they sell fries? Yep. Do they sell milkshake? Yep. Now, if you work at McDonald's, friends, if you work at McDonald's, why don't you then go over to Burger King and say, well, you know what, I'm going to get my paycheck from Burger King. Because here's the thing, Burger King sells burgers and they sell fries and they sell milkshakes. Now why don't you get your paycheck from Burger King? If you're an employee at McDonald's, just go to Burger King and say, well it don't matter, one, one burger place is just good as another, another, right? They also sell burgers, fries, and milkshake. Or why don't you go to Wendy's? See here's Wendy's. Now their burgers are a little differently, right? And that's what, isn't that what denominations are? We're going to do things just a little different, you know, different methods and, you know, opinions, whatever. I mean, Wendy's got square hamburgers. It's still a hamburger, right? And they don't really have a milkshake. It's, it's more, it's a frosty, you know. It's like a real thick ice cream, soft serve ice cream. Kind of like a milkshake, not really, but hey, you know, whatever. You can tweak it, call it your own. It's still a burger place, right? Burger, fries, milkshake. Now, if you work at McDonald's, why don't you get a paycheck from Wendy's? Because it's not the same place. Now, friends, here's my point. <clears throat> All these churches that say the church is not important, when you start saying, well, you have to be a member of the church that you read about in the Bible in order to be saved, you know what they all start saying? Well, we all, we all, we all the same. Now, friends, McDonald's, Burger King, and Wendy's are not the same. They're not the same. They, they, not, they may sell similar things, but they're not the same. And the Lord's church may do some things that are similar <clears throat> to what these other churches are doing, right? They're singing in these other churches, man-made churches. They're singing in these man-made churches. There's, you can call it preaching, I guess, right? So, well, they're all, you know, just different methods and whatever, but we all basically the same. We all believe Jesus. Well, all these places sell hamburgers. But they're not the same. Well, but they all under one big, you know, one big burger place. There's not a one big burger place. What, a United International Burger Place? See, they're not the same. But when it comes to churches, people want to say, well, they're all the same. Don't really matter which one you go to. Well, it doesn't really matter where you get your paycheck if you work at McDonald's. 
You get a paycheck from Burger King and Hardee's and Dairy Queen, and then you're going to get a paycheck from Wendy's. Where, where are you going to get out? Where are you going to go? See, now, listen. If the one body is the church of Christ, then is it the same as the Baptist church or the Methodist church or the Lutheran church or the Apostolic church? That's what I'm trying to get people to realize. Friend, you say, well, I'm in this church and I'm in that church and they're in that church. But we're all in the church of Christ. No, no, not, not the same. Not the same. You got to work from the Lord. Yes, James. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to ask a question. All right. Uh, who, uh, you know that the Bible teaches that when a religion's religion goes into effect, that uh, somebody has to die and shed their blood, innocent blood. Um, I think I'm following you. What, what's your What's your question? Well, I was just gonna say, who died for these uh, denominations? We know that uh, Jesus died for the Church of Christ. Right. The Church of Christ with His own blood. But we're wondering, like. Joseph Smith, we know it had to be uh, innocent mm. blood that died. Right, right. And that, uh, like uh, Elijah Muhammad, the Muslim uh, guy that started the Muslim right, religion. Right. I see your point. Who died? He don't even recognize Christ as a savior. Right. He died for that religion and shed their innocent blood for that religion. Right, right. It kind of yeah. goes along with what James teaching. Right. Thank you. Yeah, all right, thanks for the call. Yeah, that's a good, I mean, and that's, that's a very good point. All these churches that people say are part of the Church of Christ, Christ did not die for them. He died for his church. Now, friends, how would you like it if I said, well, you know what, um, uh, old, old, old Fred out there, he's got a nice, he's got a nice car, nice truck. Uh, he paid for it, but I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that it's mine. What? What? He didn't. He didn't pay for my car. I'm gonna say, well, this, this this car right here belongs to my friend because he paid for it. He said, I didn't buy your car. Now listen, you start telling your friends that your car belonged to them because they paid for it, and you gonna run a car. Somebody's gonna say, hey, I'm gonna take that car then if it's mine. But if you bought it, you go, no, that, that's my car. You can't have it. You don't go around saying that things that belong to you belong to someone else. Why do you go around saying that churches that don't belong to Christ belong to him? He don't want them. Now, if someone says, well, you know what? My, my big four-wheel drive mud hog out here, it belongs to you, James. I said, All right, hand me the keys. Let's go. I'll take it. You want to say it belongs to me? Hey, I'll take it. But you know what, when it comes to the, to the Lord, you say, well, the Methodist church, it belongs to Jesus. He don't want it. The Baptist church, it belongs to Jesus. He doesn't want it. The apostolic church, he don't want it. He didn't die for it. He didn't shed his blood for it. He doesn't want it, friends. Why do you keep saying it belongs to him? He didn't even think about it. All these man-made churches were started by men who didn't shed a drop of blood for them. They all started these churches and then they died. But Jesus died and then started his church. Now don't tell me they're all the same. Don't tell me they're all the same. They're not the same. Now friends, this is why it's so important. Because baptism puts you into one church that you read about in the Bible and it's the Lord's church. It's the Lord's church. It's the church you read about in the Bible. And the way you become a member of the Lord's church is you hear the gospel and you believe it. <clears throat> Acts 15 to verse 7. You repent of your sins. Acts 17 to verse 30. God commands all men everywhere to repent. You confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Acts 8 verse 37. And then you're baptized for the remission of sins. And God places you in the church of Christ. Acts 2 verse 47. Friends, if we can help you, where I'm out of time... I'm going to take this call off the air. 
But for stay on the line. But friends, we're out, of, we're out of time. So until next time, if we can assist you in any way, always remember, ask what does the Bible say? And you'll get a word for the Lord. Thanks for watching. Have a good night. Caller, you there? Hello? That's a no.